sing with me. Under the sea, darling, it's better. On where it's drier, take it from me. Okay, okay, I know these are not the correct lyrics to this famous Disney song, but hear me out. The deep sea is not all about singing mermaids and dancing crabs. It's actually filled with monster-like creatures that'll give you nightmares. So, if you're ready to meet them, grab your scuba gear and let's dive into the deep, mysterious waters to discover their fascinating and scary world. With its menacing appearance, one could call this fishy the vampire of the sea. Well, named for their disproportionately large, razor-sharp fangs protruding from their mouth, fang tooths are actually quite small and harmless to humans. These choppers are actually more for catching prey than causing trouble. So there's no need to panic if you see one. And you'll be even more relieved to know that it's kind of unlikely for you to come across a fang tooth, since they are among the deepest living fish. A regular day in the life of a fang tooth looks like this. By day, they prefer to remain in the gloomy depths. Me too, fishies, me too. It's only towards the evening that they migrate toward the surface to have a feast under starlight. Ah, how romantic! And by daybreak, they return to the deep. What a chill schedule, am I right? So, as you can tell from their daily routine, fang tooths are among the more active deep-sea fishes. And by that I mean they seek out their food rather than just sitting and waiting. And thanks to their oversized teeth and mouth, hey, I can relate, they're able to attack prey that are even larger than themselves, which is very important in the very large, food-poor deep sea. Fitting to their environment, common fang tooths are dark-colored, either solid brown or black. And unlike most deep-sea fishes, they do not have light-producing organs or cells to communicate with each other or to attract their prey. Instead, they rely heavily on their sense of smell, in addition to making use of even the slightest bit of sunlight that makes it down to the depths. This light doesn't help them to see in any way, but it may be enough for potential prey to cast a shadow as they pass overhead, which lets fang tooths know they're around. Now here's one hilarious fun fact before we move on to the next creature. Fang tooths can never close their mouths because of their huge mouths and long teeth. But you know what? I would bet maybe 500 bucks that my orthodontist would claim he could fix that too. Our next horrific deep-sea animal is as real as a kraken can get. Giant squid, which actually did inspire the legends of the kraken, live up to their name. The largest one ever recorded by scientists was almost 59 feet long. It also probably weighed nearly a ton. You would think such a massive animal wouldn't be hard to miss. But since giant squid live deep underwater, they are difficult to come by. Giant squid, along with their cousin, the colossal squid, yep, they are different, have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're somewhere around 10 inches in diameter. In other words, they are around the size of dinner plates. Peekaboo! Having such large eyes allows them to detect objects in the lightless depths of the ocean, where most other animals would see nothing. Not a zippo. Giant squids have eight arms and two long feeding tentacles that help them seize their prey. These tentacles are tipped with hundreds of powerful sharp teeth and are often double the length of their body. This helps them to snatch prey up to 33 feet away. Hey there, come a little closer. Most of what we know about giant squids come from those that floated to the surface and were found by fishermen. After years of research, it was only in 2012 that a group of scientists were able to successfully film a giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time. Yet again, the giant squid continues to remain largely a mystery due to their inhospitable deep-sea habitat. And maybe they're shy. Speaking of squids, this species is basically the space creature of the ocean. So, it's only been about 20 years since the big fin squid family was officially described by scientists. And there are still plenty of facts about them that are yet to be discovered. However, the big fin squid sightings as deep as 20,000 feet below the surface suggest that they can live deeper than any other known squid. You know what? Let's scratch the word space creature and call them the disco dancers of the deep sea to make things a little less scary. Because of their long slender arms, adorned with extravagant rib-like fins, kind of make them look like they're ready to hit the dance floor. 
Anyway, these boogie arms and tentacles are estimated to max out at just under 30 feet. Aside from the estimations, though, the largest known big fit squid was actually 21 feet long, with 20 feet of that being its arms and tentacles. How exactly a big fin squid uses them is still unknown, but scientists think they like to use them to trap prey that bump into them as they hang down in the water below their body or drag along the seafloor. There are only around a dozen confirmed big fin squid sightings worldwide, so you can just relax, because the chances of you getting hugged by a big fin squid are close to impossible. But I can't guarantee anything regarding your nightmares. <laughs> Now, these are not one of your regular Jaws sharks. Let's start with the most strange fact about a frilled shark. It's considered a living fossil because of its primitive anatomic traits. That actually makes more sense once you learn that this species has been around for 80-some million years. So I have both good news and bad news. Frilled sharks live in the open ocean and spend much of their time in deep, dark waters far below the surface. However, they do feed at the surface of the ocean at night. When hunting food, they move like an eel, bending and lunging to capture their prey. And they can actually swallow it as whole, even if it is larger than their own size. This is all thanks to their long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 recurved needle-like teeth. Okay, I am somewhat freaked out now. Unlike the rest of the deep-sea creatures I've talked about, frilled sharks might sometimes accidentally get caught in nets. So if fishing is your thing, <laughs> beware. This telescope won't help you see the stars and the planets. With its protruding eyes and elongated body, this little swimmer looks like it's wearing a pair of underwater binoculars, hence the name the telescope fish. Found in cold, deep, tropical to subtropical waters worldwide, they're known to be the species that undergoes one of the most drastic transformations in fishes. When the first larva was described in 1954, it was believed to be a new species rather than the larva of a telescope fish that were known to science since 1901. Despite the fact that they are only around 6 to 8 inches long, they're able to latch onto snacks that are bigger than their own size. That is thanks to their massive and highly stretching jaws, making up most of the size of their head. These large prey are then folded in half to fit in their expandable stomach. In 1925, scientists found a 5.5 inch long fish inside the stomach of a 3 inch long telescope fish, which they described as neatly folded. Despite all this, their cylindrical tube shaped eyes are still the most fascinating and bizarre features of telescope fishes. Their specific shape increases light collection to help them detect their prey's weak bioluminescence even from a distance. But although their eyes are good for seeing things in the twilight, they're especially great at seeing silhouettes from below. That's why they orient themselves vertically in the water. Now I have to admit they look kind of cute if you ask me. Sort of like uglier versions of minions. Yeah, right? For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. 
The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kinda mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu, or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. 
But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. You're strapped in a boat cruising down the Amazon River with the sun scorching hot. As you check out your map, your boat starts rocking back and forth. The water is starting to get more intense, so you hang on for dear life. You tuck your map in your pocket and try to take control of your boat. You strike some jagged rocks and duck low to avoid tree branches. Your boat strikes a large rock out of nowhere and capsizes. You're swimming in the murky green water. While you're trying your best to get ashore, your boat gets washed away. Underneath the water lies a whole new world of bizarre and dangerous animals. Kandiru fish are snake-like creatures that can grow up to 16 inches long. Arapimus can weigh more than an adult male and are taller than most basketball players. They're the biggest freshwater fish in South America. They have a hybrid gill system that forces them to pop up to the surface every 5 to 15 minutes to breathe in oxygen for their large swim bladder. You swim out of the raging water and dry yourself off. Oh no, your map is completely soaked. There's no way you can get to your destination without it. You venture into the thick rainforest, shoving the branches and leaves away. As you get deeper, you notice something on a tree. It's barely moving, but it's got sharp claws and a raggedy coat. It stretches its arm to another branch and tries to pull itself up, ever so slowly. Sloths sleep more than half their days and only head down from trees once a week. They're so motionless, they sometimes grow algae and moss on their fur. The rainforest gets denser with each step until there's barely any sunlight illuminating the path in front of you. You notice a figure following you. With every branch you step on, you can hear a faint sound right next to you creeping around. You start walking a bit faster, and the sound catches up with you. You make it out of the dense part and tread along a narrow path until you reach a cliff. You can't walk normally here, 
so you pin against the wall and walk sideways to cross the hills. You slowly move across with the river 30 feet below you. You move your right foot and some rocks fall into the river. You keep going and misstep. You're about to fall, but you hold on to a large tree branch and pull yourself up. You notice a couple of colorful poison frogs inches away from your fingers. Touching any of these frogs can be extremely dangerous and harmful, despite their amazing color patterns. The golden poison frog is one of the most poisonous animals in the world. One of them hops right next to you, so you let go of the branch and fall back in the river. The river is washing you down until you reach a calm current. Underneath you is a swarm of piranhas swimming with their sharp teeth. The red color on their skin is unmistakable, so you swim off like an Olympic athlete. Piranhas will eat anything that gets in their way, no matter the size. You grip onto a log and climb up a small rock to catch your breath. There's a huge electric eel underneath the rock. Despite their name, they're more related to catfish than eels. They use their powerful 600 volts of electricity to defend themselves and catch food. You're stuck, unless you're like the common basilisk that can run on the water like a jet ski. These incredible lizards have special webbing on their toes and can run the distance of a basketball court. You hop on a bunch of rocks until you reach the land. You continue walking along the riverbank until you come across a moving rock. You rub your eyes and see it moving again. It's a dinosaur-looking turtle that resembles a crocodile with armor. The Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle that disguises itself with its surroundings to catch prey. Their heads stretch longer than their bodies. You shimmy your way past it and continue. You head back into the rainforest and find a spot to rest. Wait, there are giant ants everywhere. They're the biggest ants in the world and can produce one of the most painful stings out there, even comparable to a wasp's sting. You immediately get up and find another place to rest. As you continue walking along, you notice the same feeling of something following you. You can hear some leaves rustling, but it's getting dark and there's no way of telling. You find a nice little spot to build a campfire and catch some Zs, but in the Amazon, everything is a threat, except for those cute capybaras wandering around. They live in groups next to water sources. They're also the biggest rodents in the world. You don't need to worry about them if you're stuck in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Suddenly, you feel something slithering up next to you. You look down and see a massive green anaconda just about to constrict you. They are the heaviest snakes in the world and can grow up to 20 feet long and have a huge appetite. You get up and sprint your way out of there. All right, you found a decent cave to crash in. It's daytime again and you're still alive. You continue walking along the rainforest. You were able to find some breakfast to boost your energy for the rest of the day. You spot something on a tree that looks like a branch, but it's actually a potu, a master of disguise that can spend days motionless on broken tree branches. These bizarre birds use those branches as their permanent home, where they lay their eggs and chill all day. You continue your way through the rainforest and see a Brazilian wandering spider crawling on a tree branch right in front of you. Eight of these species can be found in the Amazon area. They are some of the most aggressive and venomous spiders out there. So you make a big detour and walk away from it. You feel someone walking next to you again, but you still can't figure out what it is. You see a steep cliff with a waterfall hitting a large lake ahead of you. Looks peaceful until you see a team of black caimans gathering around the shore. They're the biggest predators in the whole Amazon ecosystem and feed on anything that moves. It's a good thing you're on high ground. Otherwise, whoa, you slip and fall down the river right on the deep end. So far, no caiman spotted you. You swim underwater and try to get to the opposite end of where the reptiles are. As you climb out and dry yourself off, you notice some large black spots on you. You try pulling them off, but they've latched on pretty hard. The Amazon giant leech finds its target by tracking movement and shadow. Once they attach themselves to the skin, it's extremely difficult to extract them. The best way to do so is to slide your finger next to its mouth and pull it off slowly. Ugh. You manage to get them off your body and see that the caimans are swimming towards you. 
You're pinned to the wall, with the lake of hungry reptiles approaching. Suddenly, a pink dolphin jumps out of the water and splashes all over them. They can grow larger than humans and are the celebrities of the Amazon. Scientists think they get their color from the blood capillaries on their skin. The Amazon even has bull sharks swimming around. These carnivorous giant fish are threatening to humans and can swim in both salt water and fresh water. These sharks prey on anything within their reach, including other sharks. The dolphin distracted the caimans, so you climb up the cliff and try to find the best way to escape. Opened jaws waiting for you to fall into the pit are right below you. You're lucky enough to escape to the top, but as your arms pull you up, the first thing that you see is a jaguar looking straight at you. It's the creature that's been following you this whole time. You get up while it starts circling you, timing its strike. You know that you can't take on a jaguar, nor can you outrun it, so you grab a large tree branch from the ground to defend yourself. It jumps at you, but you duck down in time. The jaguar lands in the water far away from the caiman crocs. It's a good thing these large kitties are excellent swimmers. You pick yourself up and continue. And to your surprise, you find your boat again. You fix it up and sail your way out of the Amazon. Whew. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that, at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number six. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> A lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean. And it's salty. Like, a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup. You'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. 
The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep-sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred-foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take for example the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe 
that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech, too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote-controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean. And in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more, but getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. 
It's a big target, and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research, even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city, except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets, where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. 
No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late. Your boat hits a rock. The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lance Head, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lance heads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again.
There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And, so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes, but there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras, but it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal Village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun, drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. There is a place deep in the ocean where pressure is 1,000 times stronger than that we're used to at the surface. This force is enough to turn an unprotected human into dust instantly. Well, maybe more like mud. Anyway, that's why explorers need some serious preparation and equipment to survive in such extreme conditions down in the Mariana Trench. It is as wide as 20 national malls in Washington, D.C., and about one-fifth as long as the diameter of Earth. People who went all the way down describe it as a chilly, quiet, and very peaceful place. They saw a bright blanket of red and yellow rocky outcrops, and there was a whole variety of unique, small, translucent animals. The popular myth is that more people have gone to the moon than to this deepest place on Earth is not true, though. In total, 24 humans flew to the moon. And at least 27 brave souls dove down to the Mariana Trench. Most of them were explorers and not proper scientists. They just go there for the thrills and also to collect video evidence of different wildlife, geological formations, and human-made objects. Humans started traveling around space and into the ocean depths at around the same time. The first moon landing was in 1969. And the first person to go down the Challenger Deep 
the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, did so in 1960. This unusual location got its name after the British ship HMS Challenger, which first located this massive drop in the ocean floor at the end of the 19th century. It would take eight more decades before the first human went down to it. Explorers didn't manage to do it in a conventional submarine. They used a type of submersible called a bathyscape. The Swiss oceanographer Auguste Picard designed his own in 1953. Seven years later, the submersible managed to do the impossible. It had reached a depth of nearly 36,000 feet. But what explorers saw was merely a fraction of the trench's full size. The fact that it is so huge of the Mariana Trench is just one of the reasons why it's mostly unexplored today. The absence of light is another major issue. Sunlight is incapable of reaching such profound depths, so the entire trench from top to bottom lies in absolute darkness. Because of such conditions, the ecosystem is a lot different than the shallower regions of the Pacific. This puts immense pressure on marine wildlife. Yeah, the pun is intended. Another reason why it's so challenging to survive there is the temperature. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the ocean is just a couple of degrees above freezing. One of the factors that hasn't let this area turn into a giant icicle is the fact that salt water has a slightly lower freezing point. The other reason is geothermal energy that warms the ground at the bottom of these just enough for it not to freeze. That's why submersibles need to have proper insulation to navigate these icy conditions. When they reach the bottom, researchers find out that this desolate and harsh climate is home to several animal species. They encountered arrow-tooth eels, snailfish, and spoonworms at various depths. There were even strange-looking translucent sea cucumbers and shrimp-like amphipods. The biggest surprise was microbial mats thriving on methane and hydrogen from the mud. Among the species, the Mariana snailfish looks like a master of the environment that can go farther and deeper into the trench to feed on prey than its competitors. Despite its seemingly fragile appearance, the snailfish has adapted to withstand extreme pressures, a superpower it wouldn't be able to survive without. The exotic life forms that live deep down aren't normal sized, since deep sea gigantism makes them grow significantly larger than their counterparts in other ecosystems. One example is the giant tube worm, which can be 6 feet long. Science has a hard time explaining the exact cause of this form of gigantism. Thermal vents are just one of the possible explanations. All of these factors might help explain the huge time gap in researching the Mariana Trench. The first successful dive after the 1960 expedition came only in 2012. That's when the famous Canadian film director James Cameron went down in the Deep Sea Challenger. Because few scientists have gone that deep before or after Cameron, there is no map of the deepest point on our planet. We know very little about the oceans that cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface. Researchers have mapped out only 5% of them so far. Science still has a lot to discover in the Mariana Trench and other unexplored places on our planet. The Amazon rainforest stands as the best example of the world's most unexplored regions. The list of reasons why this part of South America is unknown starts with its wildlife – jaguars, anacondas, piranhas, black caimans, and Brazilian wandering spiders are just some of the creatures that pose a risk for researchers. Relentless year-round rainfall induces heavy flooding. Add to all this some treacherous river currents, and you can see why scientists have mapped such a small percentage of the Amazon to date. In just one region of Brazil, near Peru, there are at least 14 tribes that have never had contact with the outside world. The national authorities intend to keep it that way. Isolation of these indigenous people is the best way to protect their future. The same goes for a remote island in the Indian Ocean. After the tragic tsunami of 2004, helicopters flew over North Sentinel Island to make sure its inhabitants were alive and well. Meanwhile, the Sentinelese weren't thrilled. 
They took up bows and arrows to drive away the unwanted visitors. This tribe is one of the last uncontacted tribes on Earth. Although anthropologists and filmmakers visited the island in the late 1960s, we still don't know much about its indigenous population. It sits a long way off any shipping lanes in the Bay of Bengal. North Sentinel has no natural harbor, and it's surrounded by a shallow reef. This makes access to the island possible only by boat. The Indian officials who lay claim to the island have prohibited outsiders from visiting the island for safety reasons. The estimates on how many people inhabit the island vary significantly, from as few as 15 to as many as 500. The island is not tiny, it's about five times as big as London's Heathrow Airport. Apart from occasional contact during the past two centuries, the Sentinelese must have been isolated for a long time. They are related to other indigenous groups in the Andaman Islands, but their neighbors cannot understand a word of their language. The continent of Antarctica has no permanent human settlements at all. The only people who periodically live there are international scientists. This vast expanse of ice and snow roughly the size of the United States and Mexico combined, still has many regions where humans haven't set foot. Satellite imagery and photos that NASA's aircraft made from the air have mapped out the entire continent. So we know where to go, but it's not that easy. The reason for this are all the adjectives that go with Antarctica. It is the coldest, windiest, driest, and brightest of the seven continents. This makes it virtually unlivable. More than 99% of its surface is covered with a permanent sheet of ice. Its thickness ranges from 1 mile to as many as 3 miles in some places. That's half the height of Mount Everest. Now the Himalayan range contains the world's tallest unclimbed mountain. It is also the tallest mountain in Bhutan. In the local language, the mountain's name translates as White Peak of the Three Spiritual Brothers. Out of respect for the spiritual beliefs of the local population, national authorities restricted and then completely banned mountaineering at the beginning of the 21st century. To this day, there is no evidence that any climber has ever managed to successfully reach the summit of this mysterious mountain. Most of the ocean is still shrouded in mystery, whether we're talking about dark corners or creatures that are hiding in the depths. But sometimes, it gives us a peek into scary things it hides in its cold, dark depths. Like when you hear on the news that there are some deep sea creatures washed ashore after a powerful storm once again. Some just look weird, while others are real monsters that live at depths of more than 3,300 feet. The coldest and deepest parts of the ocean have created one specific phenomenon called gigantism. So, sea spiders, squids, worms, and many other animals, mostly invertebrates, or creatures without backbones, they're all way bigger and scarier than the versions we see in the more shallow areas. In the Pacific depths, you can see a sea sponge as large as a minivan. Or what about the colossal squid that lives in sub-Antarctic waters and is nearly 14 times longer than the arrow squid, a type that mostly lives in New Zealand? Researchers found many of these underwater monsters in the abyssal zone of the ocean. Back in 2021, the researchers showed images of the giant phantom jelly. It was at a depth of 3,200 feet. Its tentacles were 33 feet long. Wow, I wouldn't like to face that one on the beach. It probably eats only small fish and plankton, but it can swim to depths of more than 21,900 feet. And down there, this giant jelly doesn't have enough food. How does it survive then? Scientists haven't figured it out yet. And there are even more questions related to the giant squid, the biggest one ever found. This monster is 43 feet long, with a weight of nearly a ton. Imagine if those tentacles would grab your car, or something like that. They would smash it like it was a toy. There's no light in the abyssal zone, Sun rays just can't penetrate that deep, so there's no algae or underwater plants there. Local animals mostly eat snow. Marine snow is not like the regular one you build a snowman with. 
It consists of any small flakes or remains that fall from the surface of the ocean. Maybe even some leftovers that animals up there couldn't eat. So it's not much, but apparently it's enough for very large creatures that hide deep down there, like giant squids. Squids that generally live at such depths don't bother going after their prey. They just wait until the poor animal swims right up to their long tentacles and falls into a trap. It may not be the best method ever, because not many animals will even swim into these dark cold parts, but it's the method that saves energy. A giant squid eats only one ounce of fish daily, which is approximately 45 calories. That's nearly 50 times fewer calories than an average person should eat per day. So when a squid gets one fish, it saves it for a couple of days. I hope giant squids won't get the idea to go to the surface and look for food when there's not enough of it in the abyssal zone. And I hope even more that giant Greenland sharks won't get that same idea. You can find them at depths of up to 7,200 feet. They're twice as slow as we usually walk. They swim at a speed of 1.12 feet per second. Their slowness is part of the energy-saving mechanism that creatures down there need to survive. But they can speed up in the form of short bursts when they need to catch prey. But they kind of change their diet from predator to scavenger, considering their environment. There will be more leftovers falling from the surface than animals to go after. Greenland sharks grow just 0.4 inches per year, and they're mostly 20 feet long, which means they live for a very long time sometimes up to 400 years. They also have a slow metabolism, and that's one of the main factors for their long life, too. Greenland sharks like to spend their time in cold waters. They're adapted to that, since their tissues have specific chemical compounds that prevent the forming of ice crystals all over their body. That means they have some sort of natural antifreeze. So what makes them so big? Scientists are still not sure, but some theories try to explain it. There's this thing called Cliver's Rule that says bigger animals tend to be more efficient. Just take a small fish and compare it to a whale with a mass hundreds of times bigger. The whale has a greater metabolism. It conserves energy more efficiently and loses less of it to the surroundings through heat. Moving on, bigger animals can ingest bigger prey. They're more likely to go through tough issues in their environment or defend themselves from predators going after them. Also, the body gets bigger when temperatures are lower. The Greenland shark is a perfect example. So are giant sea spiders. Sea spiders are generally common, and you find some very small ones at 0.04 inches. But in deeper parts of the Antarctic, they become three foot long giants. They grow so big because the cold water has more oxygen. That way, more of it diffuses into the animal's body, and that allows it to grow bigger. Yeah, both as a creature and a nightmare. And how about this giant tube worm? Researchers found it accidentally while they were exploring the mysteries of the Pacific Ocean floor. They stumbled upon unusual hydrothermal vents. Volcanic heat is a thing that gets them going. As water seeps down through faults or cracks in the rock, these vents change their direction. When the water gets out of the vent, it's rich in different minerals and chemicals. Most animals wouldn't survive being around this toxic soup of chemicals, but not these tube worms. They came as a true surprise, because not only are they not bothered by these toxic vents and the almost boiling temperature of the water, but they developed entire ecosystems there. They're unique because they don't need sunlight to survive. Instead, small bacteria are their main source of energy. That bacteria gets their energy directly from these toxic chemicals. So it's not photosynthesis, but a process called chemosynthesis. And these tube worms don't have mouths. These bacteria live inside them. Strange story, huh? Plus, these scary worms reach up to eight feet. Giant isopods are no better either. They lurk at the depths of the ocean of 1,640 feet or more below, far away from the sunlight, looking like some monstrous wood lice. They spend most of their time on the seabed, hoping to find some food falling from higher levels of the ocean. Check out their small hooked claws at the ends of their legs. 
Isopods use them to remain more stable while moving around the ocean floor. Since there's no light, they have long antennae that help them feel their way around. These sensory antennas are about half the length of their body. Giant isopods have pretty big eyes compared to their body size, too. They can grow over 12 inches from head to tail. And these fellas are really patient. Remember how we said animals down there rarely get food? Sometimes they need to wait for years to get a proper meal. That's why their metabolism is amazingly slow. Five years later. They can go for five years without eating anything. Imagine that. I get hungry just talking about this. In 2006, a biologist did research to compare the differences between the shallows and the deep sea regions. He realized the deep sea mirrors the island rule. First, isolated parts of land develop biodiversity you won't find anywhere else. Second, small-bodied life there grows much bigger when it's isolated compared to life on large land masses. Resources are limited, but also competition and predators. And we don't know much about these deep sea creatures. It's too expensive and too complicated to carry out such research. So we'll just wait for more raging storms to show us at least part of the monstrous world cold ocean depths hide. So you're swimming two miles down at the bottom of the ocean. Don't ask me how, just play along. It's cold and the pressure is intense. No fish in sight. Then you notice a green, shiny thing. It's a cookie cutter shark. Its neck glows in the dark to attract fish and other delicious treats. The shark doesn't look like much. It's small, about the size of a cat. It has brown skin and large green eyes. But looks can be deceiving. Every night, this creature rises to the surface and goes after great white sharks, whales, even swordfish. If you look closely, you'll see a round mouth with a bunch of sharp teeth in it. They don't just bite, they work kind of like a saw. This one's called a cookie-cutter shark because when it sees something delicious, it takes a cookie-shaped bite out of it. These sharks have even been known to disable submarines. Wonder what flavor they are. Our next shark is about the length of a car. Only about a hundred of these sharks have ever been seen, but if you met one, you'd never forget it. It has a big mouth, a huge mouth, a mega mouth, like me! It's the mega mouth shark. You could easily fit in it if you curled yourself up. They're not dangerous though, not to humans. They feed by swimming around with their mouths open, filtering out plankton and other underwater goodies. The shark has special organs in its mouth that glow, attracting little crustaceans. It swims deep in the ocean in total darkness. Probably has a great smile, though. Thresher sharks also have a huge body part, the tail. It's almost half the length of the shark itself, and it looks like a helicopter blade. It's one of the few animals that hunts using its tail. The shark sneaks up on a school of fish and starts to shake its moneymaker. This freaks out some of the fish, which is exactly the plan. In a pinch, it can also use its tail to defend itself. The best thing about this shark? It doesn't attack people. The angel shark. There are quite a few types of angel shark out there, but they're more shark than angel. They're flat like stingrays, and their skin is covered with patterns that help them blend in with the seafloor. Because of this disguise, divers sometimes accidentally touch them, which isn't the best idea. They're fast and have powerful jaws. Still, they prefer the taste of small fish to you. The horn shark has two ridges that look like horns right above its eyes. It's definitely the grandpa of the shark world. Not aggressive, swims pretty slowly, and is up late almost every night. Its two favorite meals, sea urchins and crustaceans. It moves its fin on the seafloor almost as if it had paws. But don't underestimate this guy. It has one of the strongest bites of any shark. It needs those strong teeth to crush the shells of its late-night meals. And if something tries to attack it, watch out! Horn sharks have sharp spikes on their fins. The award for the ugliest shark goes to the goblin shark. And it's not even close. From the outside, it already looks kind of weird and is about the size of a pink underwater motorbike. It has a long tail and a seriously long nose. 
It lives way down in the depths of the ocean and loves to eat squid. It's not as fast as its relatives, but it's way more sneaky. It has a secret squid-catching technique which is totally wild. The shark swims behind the squid. It's catching up, getting closer and closer. But the squid isn't slowing down, no way! It looks like the poor goblin shark won't have any lunch today. Then it opens its mouth. Its jaw is attached to folds of skin that mean it can literally throw its jaw out of its mouth. And it's a shark, so those teeth are sharp. That extra reach helps it grab its lunch, and when the meal's over, it pops its jaw back in its mouth. These sharks have been seen many times off the coast of Japan. They're actually named after the goblins in Japanese myths and fairy tales. There's only one thing out there cooler than a ninja shark. It's the ninja lantern shark. Imagine there's a tube you can slide down that takes you to the bottom of the ocean. It's too dark, you can't see anything. Suddenly, a glowing dot, moving around in the distance. It's coming closer, shooting towards you. It's a blue, glowing head. Worse, it looks like this head doesn't have a body attached to it. The ninja lantern shark has black skin, so it's almost invisible in the dark. It's only the size of a human arm, but its small, sharp teeth are no joke. No one really knows why this shark glows. Maybe to attract tasty fish? Another theory out there is that it uses this light to communicate with its friends. It has friends? The hammerhead shark. These ferocious sharks can weigh up to half a ton. They live in tropical waters all over the world, and they're one of the most recognizable sharks out there. Their eyes really are located on the sides of their hammerhead. This means they can see in almost all directions. They even have special neck muscles to lift their head up and down just to see that little bit better. Their favorite food? Stingrays. You know, those flat things that swim along the seafloor, camouflage to look like sand and bits of rock. Stingrays get by by blending in with their surroundings. Danger mostly just swims by. But the hammerhead's eyes see everything. Uh Uh-oh. Great white sharks, hammerheads, and other large sharks live for about 25 years. But one shark can live much, much longer. The Greenland shark can live anywhere from 300 to 500 years. It lives mostly in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. It loves to swim deep down where it's dark, so it uses its nose to sniff out food. Since it spends so much time down there, it's figured out how to withstand the strong pressure. It's one of the oldest living, largest, and slowest fish on Earth. Just imagine, you're on an Arctic cruise and you see one of these sharks moving slowly through the freezing cold water. It might be 400 years older than you. Most sharks are omnivorous. They can go after dolphins, other sharks, crabs, sea urchins, smaller or even larger fish, hot dogs. Eh, kidding about the hot dogs. But the bonnethead shark is a bit different. It eats algae for about half its meals. It's actually related to the hammerhead shark, but its head looks more like a shovel. Can you dig it? If you see this guy swimming around, you might think it's a sea snake or a huge water worm. Frilled sharks like to swim way down at the bottom of the ocean, like a lot of sharks. When they're chasing something delicious, they move kind of like a snake. And just like a snake, They like to gulp down their lunch all in one piece. But that doesn't mean they don't have teeth. They have about 200 nice and sharp ones. The saw shark has a long, flat, and seriously spiky nose. Those teeth on its nose never stop growing. Each tooth is equipped with electric receptors to help the saw shark feel around for nearby fish, like a ship's radar. When dinner's nearby, the shark swims up and strikes with its nose waving it around like a knight showing off his skills. Meanwhile, you won't have time to blink if this guy floats past. Did you see it? How about now? Meet the fastest shark in the world, the short-fin mako shark. It can swim up to 35 miles per hour. That doesn't seem that quick on land, but underwater, that's fast. Slower than a cheetah, but faster than most dogs. It's warm-blooded, which is super rare for a shark. That helps it swim to cold and distant places where an ordinary shark simply wouldn't survive. 
The swordfish goes much faster. It can swim up to 60 miles per hour. It's not a shark, but it's still an amazing creature. In a race, the swordfish will usually come out on top. But it's not just fast, it's ingeniously fast. It has a gland next to its nose that pumps out a special oil. This oil spreads through its nose and comes out through tiny holes. This special oil is waterproof, which lets the swordfish glide through the water at high speed. In the past 30 years, scientists have made an incredible discovery of a new creature living deep beneath the surface of the ocean. And the name of the creature is the harp sponge. Now, if you're wondering why it took so long to come across this animal, then I might have the answer. These creatures typically hang out at a depth of roughly 11,100 feet beneath the ocean's waves. This sponge species was first discovered off the coast of California thanks to a robot that was sturdy enough to explore those crazy depths the ocean has to offer. This is no doubt an area of the planet where even the most benign-looking creatures can be potentially dangerous. But even scientists were surprised to find that this creature was more than just a sponge. Now, this might seem obvious, but the harp sponge got its name because its basic structure, referred to as a vein, is the same shape as a harp. Each vein is made up of a horizontal branch supporting several parallel vertical branches. But don't let the harp sponge's fanciful and amusing appearance or its non-intimidating name fool you. Yeah, the harp sponge is very much a deep-sea hunter. It has a unique ability to capture and envelop small animals using its rhizoids, short, thin fibers. With their help, the harp sponge clings on to the soft, muddy bottom and catches tiny creatures that get swept into its branches by deep-sea currents. Uh-oh. Other sponge creatures often feed by pulling bacteria and bits of organic matter from the seawater and filtering them through their bodies. But not our harp sponge. Mm -mm. Instead, it snatches its future meal with minuscule barbed hooks that cover each of the harp sponge's branches. Now, harp sponges prefer tiny crustaceans, like crabs, crayfish, shrimps, and prawns. Once the harp sponge has one of them in its clutches, it envelops the animal in a thin membrane before slowly beginning to digest it. So, pal, what's eating you? Oh, harpo? Too bad. Researchers believe that harp sponges use this method of feeding because there aren't enough nutrients that deep down. This makes traditional filter feeding less effective. Research has shown that the creature is still in the process of evolving. Early harp sponges researchers found only had two veins. But later, scientists discovered other harp sponges that had six veins. The harp sponge might have evolved this elaborate candle holder-like structure to increase its surface area. In general, harp sponges typically grow up to a length of one foot. But researchers have seen a creature that was two feet in length. The harp sponge is not wow. only very unusual, but also beautiful to look at. See those tiny white balls on top of the branches? Now, why don't we look at some other creatures that live below the photic zone of Earth's oceans? The photic zone means the area beneath the ocean's surface that still receives some sunlight. Thanks to this, there are loads of different creatures and organisms living there. Any animal living beyond this layer qualifies as a deep-sea creature. The Tomopterus worm is a segmented worm you can find in the twilight zone of the ocean. This is the area that lies between 650 and 3,300 feet beneath the surface. These creatures are often no more than one inch long, but the largest of them can grow up to one foot. While swimming around and feeding, these worms do what researchers describe as an amazing smooth dance. That's because the creatures can swim extremely quickly and maneuver at tight angles with ease. Now, I know most people hear the word worm and think of the common earthworm. So it's quite interesting to know there's a deep sea worm out there that never leaves the water during its entire life. Similarly, most of us try to avoid jellyfish that either rest on the sand or sit on top of the ocean waves. This isn't the case with a crassota jelly. That's a deep sea creature, too. This beautiful jellyfish is mostly ruby red, bright orange, or electric purple. That's what helped researchers realize they'd found a new species of jellyfish. The creature grows to a maximum size of one inch across. It has tentacles that stretch out in every direction. 
Now, if you come close to this jellyfish, it'll pull all these tentacles in toward its body before rapidly swimming away to avoid danger. Yes, you are dangerous. The chrysoda jelly is extremely rare. You won't see it very often. You might need to borrow that deep-sea diving robot I mentioned earlier. Well, worms and jellyfish might seem quite harmless. This isn't the case with the Pacific viperfish. Ooh. This creature is equipped with a noticeably big mouth, like me. And the needle-like teeth inside are key to its hunting strategy. Pacific viperfish live at around 5,000 feet below the ocean surface. But they're among those numerous marine animals that migrate each night from the ocean depths toward shallower waters to dine. What's on the menu for dinner tonight? Hmm, lots of small fish and shrimp. The creature can grow up to 12 inches in length. Its two front fangs, which stick up from the fish's bottom jaw past its own eyes, are especially dramatic. When the fish unhinges its jaw, its mouth can open wide enough to engulf smaller animals. And the teeth form a cage to prevent an escape. Now, have you ever seen an underwater creature that looks like a strawberry? Trust me, it does exist. Just look at these dots on the strawberry squid. The creature has a big eye and a smaller one. You might think this unconventional pairing would be awkward and uncomfortable, but it's actually the opposite. The big left eye looks upward. It spots shadows cast by other animals in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps it collect as much light as possible. On the other side of the squid's head, you can see its right eye. It's small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by animals lurking in the darker waters below. Now, bioluminescence means the production and emission of light by living organisms. By the way, the squid has a nickname. And no, it's not squiggy, although that's a great one. It's known as the cockeyed squid. This is simply due to the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes. Hmm, I think I like squiggy better. And so it goes. Since light doesn't reach the deep sea, the strawberry squid's body actually looks black. This helps the creature hide from enemies, such as sharks and dolphins. In general, the strawberry squid grows to a length of 5 inches. It typically lives around 3,000 feet below the surface, but floats to shallower waters at night. Now, the feather star is a marine creature without a backbone, but with feather-like arms that radiate from the center of its body. These creatures first appeared around 200 million years ago. Related to sea stars, they look like a flower, but if you approach them, they'll quickly swim away. But not all feather stars can swim. Many species can only crawl along the bottom of the seafloor. Like some of the other deep-sea creatures we've looked at, the feather star can adapt to its surroundings. It has a creepy ability to shed its arms, the same way some lizards can shed their tails. This also helps them escape from their enemies. Feather stars live all across the globe, from the equator to the poles, from the shallow waters on top of reefs to the deep, deep sea. Now, given that we're dealing with mysterious creatures, the name of this one is quite fitting. The swift vampire squid should be the official symbol of life in the deep sea. The animal has a dark red body, huge blue eyes, and a cloak-like web that stretches between its eight arms. This, along with its name, may suggest wow. that the creature is some form of a terrifying hunter. In reality, though, the vampire squid is a soft-bodied, timid creature about the size, shape, and color of a football. It grows to roughly 12 inches in length and lives 3,000 feet below the waves. There's almost no oxygen there, but also relatively few predators. Whew, I think I'll need to decompress from this one.